Hello, and welcome to the beginning of week two in Humanities 2. Today we're going to be talking about two philosophers from the 19th century and how their ideas continue this evolution that we talked about in week one of the secularization of society and our entrance into modernity. The first of these thinkers is the man before you there, Karl Marx, and the second is Friedrich Nietzsche. Marx was born in 1818 in the Rhineland in what is today Germany. Um, Marx's early life seems relatively standard. His family did convert from Judaism to Catholicism, which isn't terribly common. Uh, in 1835, he entered university and began a course in the study of law. Now, studying law in the 19th century was different than it is today, <clears throat> because when you studied law, uh, back then, you had a very wide-ranging course of academic subjects. You studied philosophy, you studied history, you studied economics. It was not the narrow vocational training that people get today. Now, during his time there, eventually he transfers to Berlin. And Berlin in the 1830s is sort of a hotbed of uh, radical thought. And, you know, Marx lives kind of a wild college lifestyle. He liked to drink wine, he liked to stay up late and argue. <clears throat> the intellectual superstar of German nerds in the 19th century was Hegel. Now, I didn't make you read any Hegel for this class, and uh, yeah, you're welcome. But uh, Hegel was the dominant philosophical um, leader of both German nationalism and lots of different kinds of radical thought. So we're gonna go over a few slides about Hegel just so you can understand how he influences Marx's thought. Okay, first of all, the idea of philosophy as practice, all right? Now life, Marx lived a life of activism. He lived a life in which he believed that the life of ideas, the life in your head, it's not really worth anything unless those ideas were used to help to change society, to make the world basically a better place. This was a very important idea for Marx. Also, the historiosity of knowledge. All right, reality is a living and an evolving system. How we understand the world today is not going to be how we understand the world in a hundred years. What this means is that all of the structures in our society, religion, the state, the economy, um, all of these things evolve along with us. And as they are man-made and as they evolve, they can change. We'll talk more about that later. Marx also emphasized the idea that the economy is incredibly important for understanding the rest of society. The dialectic. Okay, for Marx, all right, the Hegelian dialectic is very important. And basically what you have is a thesis, which is an idea. The thesis then in debate generates an antithesis, the opposite of it. Those two things basically become synthesized. <clears throat> all right, and through that middle way, they create a new thesis, which then create a new antithesis this goes on and on and on. Now, why is this important? It's important because if we go back to this evolutionary idea about society, um, there are always new ideas that are coming up. These ideas are then attacked, they're adapted. Again, it's this idea of the practice of philosophy as pushing these new ideas into society. It also says that Marx didn't believe that anything was forever, all right? Everything in our society, again, is part and parcel of things that were created by human beings. And if they're created by human beings, they can be destroyed and rebuilt by human beings. Dialectical materialism is a classic Marxist idea. Basically, what it means is that the world around us, all right, this reality is purely physical. There is nothing beyond this world. There is no heaven. There is no enlightenment. There is nothing like that. So our world is dominated by a certain set of laws. 
And if we study those laws, if we change those laws, we change society. Now here's the big idea and the turn that Marx did. Hegel had said that particular kinds of societies produce particular kinds of economies. And Marx's major innovation on Hegel's work is that he switched that around. And he said, no, 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 no. It's the opposite. Particular kinds of economies produce particular kinds of societies. Our societal relationships, our classes, our religion, our state are all produced by and produced in order to protect a certain kind of economy that we have. Also, Marxist history is the history of the production of this and the conflict that goes along with it. Marx thought that capitalism was inherently unfair and contained within capitalism were certain contradictions, certain conflicts between different classes that would eventually lead to its destruction. You combine all these ideas and there's a utopian element to Marxism, right? Marx thought that if you radically change the economy of a certain society, you can radically change that society. Now, Marx's utopian ideas, I think, are the weakest point of his thought. Um, but, for example, if you had a society in which the workers, instead of the factory owners, owned all of the um, factories, then through his logic, you would have a society without inequality and without class. This society eventually would find its way to a kind of communism, right? An egalitarianism where everybody had the same amount of things. There's no private property, there's no wealth, there's no wealth, there's no poverty, there's no poverty, there's no classes. It's a nice idea. I don't believe it's particularly viable and it's gonna go some strange places in places like China and Russia. But again, the main point about dialectical materialism, all right, is that life is the physical parts of the things that we see every day. There's nothing beyond that. At the end of this presentation, I'll talk to you a little bit about his views on religion, which, as you can imagine, um, were somewhat extreme. All right, now early on in Marx's life, uh, his father passes away. Um, eventually, he's going to transfer two more times to different universities, all right? He finally ends up at Jena by 1839 and uh, writes a dissertation there. We're not gonna talk a lot about his dissertation, but more importantly, in 1842, Marx becomes the editor of this leftist journal and moves to Berlin. Now again, the 1840s uh, in Prussia, in Germany, all around uh, the countries of Europe was a particularly radical time. And Marx really steps into this kind of radicalism and he feels that he has ideas that are important to guide these various kinds of attempts at change going on throughout Europe. Now, in 1842, Marx meets Engels. Now, Marx and Engels would have a long and a very fruitful and friendly and nice relationship. It's a great bromance. Um, they both have excellent beards, and Engels is a thinker in his own right. He writes several very interesting books. Engels was very wealthy. His father owned a factory in England, and Engels basically bankrolls a lot of uh, Marx's life, and he allows him to write, and when both Marx and Engels have to go into exile in England, um, Engels pays for all that. Engels will also be the person that's going to edit a lot of Marx's works after his death. Now, as I said, the 1840s are a particularly radical time in Europe. And time and time again, Marx and Engels are uh, exiled from country to country to country. All right, in 1843, the Prussian government kicks them out, and they have to go live in Paris. Um, 
1845, the French government kicks them out of Paris and they go to Brussels. Um, in 1848, there are a set of revolutions all throughout the European continent. France, Prussia, Hungary, Italy. And these revolutions are very fascinating, but they all fail. So Marx goes home, he goes back to Prussia, all right, in 1848, but in 1850 the Prussian government is reestablished and he ends up in London where he will live for the rest of his life and where he today is buried. Now London and England in general during the 19th century was the place where free thinkers and radicals went. Um, it was the only place in Europe that had a completely free press. All right, remember, it's a constitutional monarchy. It's one of the only ones in Europe. And it's where a lot of radical thinkers like Marx and Engels ended up. Now, while Marx is in Paris, all right, he develops two different kinds of ideas that will be very important for 20th century Marxism. His Paris manuscripts are written in 1844, but they don't come out until 1929, or 1927, excuse me. Now, the first concept that he develops here is alienation. Basically, alienation is the concept that within capitalism, workers who work in the factory, all right, are alienated from the products of their labor. So we can think about it like this. If you do a piece of art or a piece of craft, a lot of people are crafting right now, um, when you create that thing, you know everything about it and you're proud of it, right? It's like a part of you. It's like having a kid or a really nice guitar. You like it. When you work in a factory, okay, you don't ever get to build one whole thing, right? You work in a car factory and you only work on one part of a car. And that means that the things you produce are fundamentally alienated from the people who produce them. Now, this has particular uh, social effects on the minds of workers all right it's not healthy okay we look at the commodities that workers produce and they seem to be separate from or distant from the workers themselves he also developed a moral critique of capitalism all right that capitalism fundamentally isn't fair people with more money make more money because they have more money and that's not really fair, all right? Um, he leads it to a critique that we'll talk about later, all right, about excess and labor, and basically comes to the conclusion that capitalism as it stands and as he saw it in the 19th century is fundamentally and morally wrong. Now, throughout the 1840s, all right, Marx develops his ideas and there are many different radical thinkers throughout Europe. And Marx spends the 1840s separating himself from these other groups. The main idea that Marx comes forward with, all right, is a radical form of communism. Now, communism and socialism are different. Socialists generally attempt to use the levers of power that are already in place in order to change society for the better. So if you think of somebody like Bernie Sanders, right, a democratic socialist, works through the democratic system using the existing laws and making new laws in order to try and make things better for workers within the United States. Marx argued, however, that because of his belief that all of the constructions and the systems within a society actually stem from the economy, Radical economic change was the only way to fully change a society. You couldn't change that society through using the political system that was already there. All right. Now, in 1848, all over Europe, all right, popular revolutions of various kinds burst onto the scene. France, Italy, Hungary, Prussia. And although these are all different, they're all relatively similar, okay? There's a nationalistic sort of a sense to them. They are uh, pro-democratic. And the other thing about them is that they all fail. 
Now, um, during this period of radicalism, um, members of various groups approach Marx and Engels at the Red Lion Pub in London, and they ask him to construct some sort of document. All right, and this document comes to be known as the Communist Manifesto. It has some very famous lines, right? Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. In this document, um, Marx put forward the idea, all right, that workers, no matter what country they're in, have more in common with each other than they do with their fellow countrymen who are factory owners. He's trying to destroy the idea of nationalism, right? It seems to assert that people within one particular geographical country have some magical connection to each other. Now, nationalism is a constructed narrative, all right? It's a made-up story. And what Marx is trying to do is to show workers of the world, right, that they have a solidarity with workers everywhere instead of a simple, narrow, nationalistic attachment to their brothers within France or Hungary or Italy or wherever. Now, there's a PDF of the Communist Manifesto for some of our readings for this week. All right, it's very short. It's a fairly interesting sort of a document. Now, unfortunately, all of the 1848 revolutions fail, and they fail for a variety of different reasons. If you ever take Civ II with me, we'll talk a lot about 1848. After the failure of these revolutions, all right, Marx is disturbed, and he goes back to his initial idea, all right, that many of the revolutions failed because they sought to redo or revolutionize the wrong thing. All right, they left in place the formal economic relationships, and they thought to redo political relationships. Marx then dives into economics. He reads Adam Smith. He reads John Stuart Mill. He reads all these people who form the foundation for capitalist thinking. And between 1849 and 1867, all right, he writes what is really his masterpiece, Das Kapital. It's a huge book, it's 900 pages, uh, but if you take economics, you read it, all right, because Marx's analyzation of capitalism is brilliant. While I don't like his uh, visions of the future or his solutions or where his ideas go, um, he's pretty spot on in terms of some of its major points. So, if you're still awake, uh, let's get to some of those, and then we'll talk about Marx and religion. Now, um, social relationships, all right, in a society are generated by exchange. Okay? So, uh, throughout history, people have exchanged things with each other. Early societies had barter economies, uh, feudal economies, capitalist economies, but a society is delineated through exchange, all right? The more exchanges you can do, the wealthier you are. If you have nothing to trade, in many societies you are nothing, right? Now a person, any person, can produce more than they need to survive. And whether this is chickens or fish or donkeys or uh, anything, or in a factory setting, all right, one person can produce a lot of things. They then use the excess things they don't need to survive to get other things. All right, now in a capitalist society, the way that the factory owner makes money, okay, is by taking your excess labor power, the things that you produce that are more than what you need to survive, and selling that. The real value of a thing, okay, is basically how much it takes to make that thing. Now, regardless of what you sell it for in the market, okay, um, the supplies and the labor that it took to construct a widget are the true value of that widget. So, um, as Marx tells us, the way capitalism works and the way it is fundamentally unfair 
is that factory owners profit off of their workers' surplus production, pay their workers as little as they can, and that's all the profit that they get to make. Now, um, every mode of production has created a particular epoch or a particular era. So, in the ancient times, we had ancient modes of production. So in feudalism, we had a particular kind of economy. And again, each of these different kinds of economy produced a different kind of society. And each of these societies, all right, had distinct divisions of labors and distinct principles of exchange. So Marx and Marxists, right, see history as this evolution of these different kinds of modes of production and the different societies in which they created. Now Marx saw capitalism as a system that was filled with um, conflict. And eventually, largely that conflict, right, is between the workers we called the proletariat and the people who own the factories called the bourgeoisie. Now, every once in a while, this conflict kind of blows up. All right, the system adapts and we move on. But that fundamental conflict was what Marx hoped one day would bring down the whole system. Capitalism creates and sustains inequalities. Because a society is based on the kind of economy, then capitalism creates a society that is based on inequalities. And this is where class comes in. Marx believed that this society was unstable. All right, There are always 100 times as many workers as there are factory owners. One day, Marx hoped, if all of those workers could attain what he called class consciousness, which is a basic realization that there are more workers than there are factory owners. Workers could act in a united form, and we could change all of this system. Now, capitalism is definitely a system that lurches between um, crisis to crisis, right? We're in a capitalist crisis right now. What we've discovered after the time of Marx is that just because capitalism has a crisis does not necessarily mean that the workers are going to rise up. Now, as human society evolves, again, we have different modes of production, it's a fancy way of saying an economy, and different modes of production create different kinds of societies. Marx and Engels hoped that we were in the second to last of these kinds of societies, which was capitalism. Capitalism, based on its inherent contradictions, would eventually lead to class conflict. And class conflict would eventually usher in a new kind of an era, which they would call communism. And again, in communism, we would radically change the modes of production, switch things around to where workers owned the factories, there was very little private property. If we did this, according to Marx, we would eliminate inequality in our society and we would revolutionize the world. Now, one of the things that Marx constantly told us about, all right, was something um, that called class consciousness. Now, class consciousness means that an individual of a particular class realizes, A, that they are part of that class, and B, the powers and responsibilities of that class. In most Marxist thought, the bourgeoisie, the factory owners, realize their class consciousness. They know the game that they're playing. The proletariat, on the other hand, because of its lack of education and because of a variety of other societal factors, does not have class consciousness. Now, why not? because the society that is produced out of this particular mode of production creates false ideologies. Now, false ideologies are basically ideas 
that try to convince you that the world is not the way that Marx thinks the world is. Again, because the society we live in is created by the economy we have, our society creates all these wonderful ideas about working hard, about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, all these things in order to mask the fact that the transfer of wealth from the bottom to the top is almost non-existent. All right, any rich person had a rich dad. I'm sorry if I'm shattering things for you, but that's almost always a reality. Now we live with this reality because frankly, it's just too damn depressing to live with the other way. But one of the main things that Marx was most hard on as being part of false ideology is religion. All right, so our last few slides, we're gonna look at religion and Marx's ideas about it. Now, um, I'm not here to convince you that religion is good or bad. We're just talking about what Marx thought, all right? Now, basically, um, Marx thought that religion was a kind of an ideology, all right? It was a kind of uh, make-believe world. And what, especially Christianity, that's mainly what he was talking about, did, was it promised you this great life in heaven if you could put up with the horribleness of 19th century factory life. And for Marx, what religion did was it placated people. It made people think that I shouldn't try to change the world that I'm living in. Um, I should just wait to go to heaven and that'll be great. All right. It sapped people's uh, desire for change. Now, ideology for Marx, all right. Um, is a belief system okay that changes people's ideas of the world and for marx all right religion is a man-made system that is meant to mask the worst parts of capitalist society and um his famous quote, all right, is that religion is the opiate of the masses. And again, what that means is that religion placates uh, or makes weak people's desire to change. It makes the world seem to be the way that God wants the world, and who are you to go against God? Again, religion had the same function for the states. And Marx thought that if you got rid of a capitalist system, religion would disappear. And largely it would disappear because life here on Earth would be so much better. Now, Lenin, who started the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution, of course, uh, called religion spiritual gin. All right. And basically he argued that the ruling classes promote religiosity among the poor as a way of distracting them really all right keeping them in a mystical fog that obscured the actual reality of how things were religion is used as a tool to legitimate power and privilege of the dominant class now again ideas of divine right very common in the 17th century and if we look at many of the main parts of Christianity, this is a rather devastating critique. All right, the meek shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. Um, I don't think religion or Christianity always has to be taken this way. I think this is an oversimplification, and we have to understand that it's within the context of the 19th century that Marx is talking. All right, but again, Marx is trying to get us to see things the way that things really are. And Marx's argument is that religion obscures the way things are and puts our head off in a daisy land. Now, again, this concept of alienation, all right? Um, workers in a capitalist society are alienated, all right? Because they do not own the things that they produce or the production process. All right. Now, 
Alienation is a controversial term. Um, but uh, Marx tells us, all right, that religion is the product of alienation. Religion creates an afterlife, an illusionary happiness, all right, that distracts attention from the true source of suffering, which is capitalism. Okay? So again, this is a fairly standard critique, all right? Religion legitimizes the way that things are. Uh, religion um, sort of makes people look in different places when the answer is really right in front of them. And it's used by uh, the ruling classes, right, the upper classes, in order to keep the working classes dumb. Now, this is a fairly standard critique of religion. Again, I don't think it's all encompassing. In the 1960s, we're going to see something called liberation theology, right? Which takes uh, a Marxist evaluation of capitalism and puts it together with a fairly different uh, reading of Christianity. Um, so I, I think we have to really take into account when Marx was talking about religion and you know why Marx was doing that. Okay, so this has been just a brief introduction to the thought of Karl Marx. Um, there will be up by today or tomorrow another um, presentation in which we will talk about the ideas of Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, remember that um, hopefully you have the book thing all sorted out. If not, I will put up uh, some other questions for this week. You'll have questions and a discussion section uh, that you'll be doing for this week. And remember to be keep uh, working on your essays as those will be due by the end of class.